official name that it goes by is Northeast Syria Democratic South Administration. Um, and this was formed in 2012, uh, while during the Syrian Civil War, um, where obviously um, Syrians in the um, in the western part of Syria starts the revolution against the long reigning Assad regime. Um, and Kurds at the time were revolting together with the um, Syrian civil revolutionary forces, but then because of the conflicts within and because of their lack of acknowledgement of the Kurdish oppression, Kurds had decided to take their own route and have formed this autonomous region. Started as a Kurdish revolution, and they were able to establish a relatively peaceful zone within that part of Syria while the rest of Syria has been um, in um, conflict and war. And so this peaceful, relatively peaceful and progressive um, experience that's taken place in Northeast Syria was a huge threat to the Turkish government because Turkey has a large Kurdish population right across from the border, right there. And so this year, in late September 2019, we had the Turkish president, who called the dictator Erdogan, gave a speech at a UN meeting, United Nations, right in New York City, right in my city. And he showed a map where he showed basically the areas that we're seeing right now. And he complained that these areas are a threat to Turkey, that this is a terrorist experiment that is threatening Turkey's well-being mm -hmm. in front of the UN. And he had his maps. And he declared that he's going to displace the Kurds from these regions and push them down to the south where they do not uh, present a threat to Turkish national uh, identity and well-being, and that he would replace the areas with his Syrian brothers and sisters. Now he's also, you know, you know, they will get into a little bit that these regional colonial powers have always used discourses and have pitted these populations against each other. So once he starts that, um, even though um, the Syrians who are Syrians who are living within Turkish borders are facing extreme oppression, exploitation, and racism of very different way, sorts, that Erdogan was using this line of Muslim Brotherhood against what he calls the European powers. And a couple of days after, when Europe started to um, um, make declarations against this occupation, he threatened Europe. He said, well, if you don't let me continue my occupation, I am going to let the Syrian refugees into your lands. I can't take care of these forever. So he found and silenced Europe. And a couple of days after, um, Trump uh, administration who was working and providing some level of support to the Syrian democratic forces because they have been the ones who have fought against the threat of ISIS in the region that has destroyed uh, towns and destroyed cultural heritage, destroyed minorities. So it's been a monstrous force um, destroying uh, the region. And so the US seeing ISIS as a threat has cooperated with Syrian democratic forces. Um, to um, to kill ISIS, but once ISIS was gone, early 2019, September of 2019, uh, for the most part, by the Kurds and Kurdish revolutionaries' leadership, Trump said, well, I will get out, based on a phone call with Erdogan. So he silenced Europe. He had Trump take the troops out of this part of Syria. And basically, Trump dis replaced these troops with the near the oil fields. So it's not like troops leaving Middle East, right? We all get these discourses. Oh, yes, we would like these troops to get out. But actually, they have not. They just have stopped protecting or being the buffer zone between these um, populations and, that have been historically oppressed and an occupier that has been 
very willing and very explicitly saying, even in UN meetings, that he would crush them, that this is a threat to Turkey's well-being. So why, so this is the current state, that since October, an occupation invasion started, and around 300,000 Kurdish people were displaced. They're living either in camps or south in isolated, um, and they had to um, suffer huge infrastructure loss and huge life losses. Hundreds were killed, and especially because Turkey has worked with the jihadi forces in the region, the militias, um, and ISIS. This is very known and very proven that Turkey has provided support to ISIS fighters in many, many ways. There's lots of reports of this. And with the use of those forces who have been especially upset with one dimension of this revolution that I'm going to emphasize, which is the feminist revolution. So some of the early losses and attacks were being conducted against um, especially women human rights fighters such as Hezen Kalat. And so this is the current situation, but the good news from the region is that they are trying to continue on with their um, revolution. They're trying to continue with reviving the communes and, um, you know, um, despite this current occupation and war against them. So I think I want to start with in saying why should we care about Rojava? Right? Why should we care? There is violence in all different parts of the world. And I see most of you have some level of interest in Rojava. Um, and we should maybe, you know, as a way of understanding why there, why are we excited about that? Why are we protecting or defending these people, populations, places, spaces, as opposed to the Uyghurs in China? We know that the oppression <coughs> is everywhere. Not that not to protect them, but there is something very promising here that's much beyond the discourses of U.S., betraying its allies, or that's much beyond the discourses of some beautiful women fighting against ISIS, fighting against Islam, right? Because in the uh, conservative um, Western discourse, obviously, this is taken in places that we're not necessarily happy about, that um, women versus Islamists or secular. So this, <coughs> these are not the terms of the debate that we want to debate. So let's um, look into why um, this is important. So Northeast Syria Democratic Self Administration. The number one important lesson here is they argued that the only way to create the peaceful existence, coexistence in the Middle East among the populations that have been historically pitted against each other is a non-state structure where people can equally participate and govern themselves and coexist in peaceful ways. So therefore, the social contract says the areas of the democratic self-administration do not accept the concept of a centralized, nationalistic, military, or theocratic state. So the understanding here is it needs to be non-state for people to live together peacefully um, and diversity and multiplicity to be cherished in ways to create a, um, a life for human beings, just life for human beings, that we need to have structures that are not state structures, that to give the power to the people, to the society, to the civil society institutions and local people from the very bottom up um, creating a confederal democratic autonomy. So that's one of the important reasons. Um, and as you see, these areas that are yellow are the Kurdish areas where the revolution first started against the Assad regime and against the other oppressors of the region. Um, so Afrin, Kobani, Jazeera region, but then Kamushlo being the very center of this. But then the revolution spread it to the Arab regions, to the majority Arab regions, and to also there are many ethnic and religious minorities in this area. And they 
to establish peace and to work together and collectively became a priority for the revolutionaries in Rojava. Because I want to emphasize it again that the rulers, governors of Turkey and Assad regime have historically pitted these populations against each other. For example, Turkey often used um, the fact that Turkmens might be repressed here, and uh, Assad is um, obviously has tried to displace Kurds from the region historically from 1960s on and uh, place Arab populations in the region, pitting the populations against each other. So this experiment is very important for the Middle East for a number of reasons, because these populations have historically been pitted against each other because when we look at the conflict in Israel-Palestine, for example, there are these notions and we're trying to be tricked by ideas as if Jewish and Palestinian people were always historically against each, and that is not true. And so this, in that sense, is a very important experience for the Middle East because in many parts of the Middle East, Sunnis and Alawites, Sunnis and Sufis, uh, the Palestinians and Jewish populations have been pitted against each other. So Rojava offers a peaceful coexistence model through confederal democracy that other parts of the Middle East can follow. And so it offers um, a hope of peace for the region and importantly, the pillars that it's built upon, in addition to this confederal system of multiplicity and diversity, are gender equality, actually feminism, which I'll try to go into in a little bit, that it is beyond gender equality. It is a society that is based on feminist principles, a new um, society and social emancipation that's based on women's emancipation. So that's very important and also ecological regeneration. So ecology has been a very important part, pillar of this revolution. And also, as I said before, the locally devolved power. So a new understanding of democracy that is not just based on elections and who rules, but instead developing bottom-up up structures so that people, civil society, gets involved in um, governing themselves. So it is, um, an important experience for that sense and it is right now under threat and for these reasons and also for especially for people like Middle Eastern um, activists who are concerned about and ever establishing peace in this part of the world this is a very important experience for that sense as well so why did the revolution start in the Kurdish areas why not the Arab-dominated areas, the Arab-majority areas? Who are Kurds? Why were they able to put forward a revolution that is based on feminism, ecology, that is based on democratic confederalism and equality and justice for all? So why did it start there? So I'll go into that a little bit. And I think um, to understand that, we need to understand Basically, it's not an essential, uh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm Kurdish, so I wish that it was like our essence that was creating this, but that's not it. It is actually the history of oppression, uh, dialectics of oppression, suppression, and resistance and struggle that has built uh, against these oppressive structures from earlier on in the Kurdish history. So um, the one important historical note to understand both imperialism, colonialism, imperialism in the region, that's very important for us to then develop non-imperial, anti-imperial solutions to global issues, is to understand the history of the Kurds in the region a little bit. So that historical episode is after World War I, when the nation state system was being built in the Middle East, um, Kurds were denied their nationhood, their statehood, and therefore their nationhood, and in a global system of governing where rights came with nationhood, if you had a nation, then you were given the right to self-determination. And if you were given the right to self-determination, then you could also grant human rights to your population. So this was the system of governing that Kurds were left out and they were instead separated into four different nation states that were in the interests of the colonial powers of the day, most importantly for this region, the British and the French. So 
Kurds were separated into four different nation states who became the regional colonizers. And this is very important because sometimes when people are supporting Assad and thinking, right, that that is because that's against US imperialism, we need to see that there are actually regional colonial powers who have been exploiting, oppressing their minorities and have been the regional superpowers that have been quite oppressive with the Turkish state, Assad regime, Iran, and Iraq. So these are the four um, different states. And to understand briefly, in Syria, prior to the civil war, um, there had, Kurds have been the largest ethnic minority living in Syria. And throughout the 1960s and 70s, um, the Syrian uh, government has done what is called the Arabization policies to basically displace the Kurds from their regions and place populate the Kurdish dominated areas with Arab populations and have given, um, um, you know, uh, more perks and uh, have included Arab populations within that state governing system. And that's another thing that states do. States do create monopoly of violence, but they do share that monopoly of violence with the majority populations that can act in the name of the state whenever necessary. So that's what the Syrian regime did um, against the Kurds. And Kurdish, it, Kurdish suffering in Turkey, within the borders of Turkey, has especially been prevalent, and that's one of my um, research areas. Importantly, the first big, large genocidal massacre that took place was in my hometown in 1938, actually from the period of 1937 to 1940, um, tens of thousands of Kurdish Alevi people from my hometown have been um, killed, have been massacred, um, and that massacres and those massacres and histories of violence have been very important for the identification of people and their considerations, understandings of the state. And similarly in Iraq, this is the most familiar from the North, um, you know, North American Canadian. This is something with the Gulf War and following that. That's probably the most familiar example of war Kurds um, and the Saddam regime during outfall operations has killed 100 to 160,000 people using chemical weapons against the people who have been well documented. And in Syria, they've also been replaced and displaced and oppressed and exploited. And if you look at even the current um, re revolts in Iran, you would see that um, the poor, uh, impoverished um, Kurdish populations and villages have been targeted the most by the Iranian regime as well. So this is a population that's been oppressed under at least four different nation states and have been used and reused at any opportunity that the colonial and imperial powers get at the promise of either freedom, at the promise of defending of their human rights. But most importantly, these experiences have created them movements and memories of struggle and anti-stateness that I call it in my book, that this, these, they, they do have uh, a notion of being against the state, a collective memory of state violence, suppressing, oppressing their populations historically, and also um, in Turkey, especially starting with the 1960s, 70s, Kurds have been increasingly involved in the leftist movements of the time, which then later was suppressed by the coup d'etat of 1980, during which time the PKK, the Workers' Party of Kurdistan, was formed. And you see Öcalan's book right there, that he, uh, Abdullah Öcalan, was the founder of the Kurdish um, Workers' Party, the PKK, and he, in the late 1970s, realized that the threat of the Turkish state against the leftist movements. So before the coup d'etat, he was able to situate a number of revolutionaries with himself to Lebanon and Syria. And that is how Öcalan became an ideological father of the Syrian revolution, all the organic connections that he's developed in the region um, with the PKK 
then later had organic ties with the um, with the uh, YPG forces of northeast Syria. So Öcalan, as a resistance movement that he started together with another person who's very important, especially for the Kurdish women's movement, her name is Sakine Jansis. Um, she actually has a memoir that I'm going to suggest um, because it's a very um, great perspective of understanding, reading Kurdish movement from the perspective of the women and the women's struggle within the Kurdish movement, because that's also very important. How come these people who've lived in these places where, you know, there are quite patriarchal gender norms, how were they able to initiate a feminist revolution? How come we see the women in the forefront? And this is something I'm, I've, it's been frustrating me because um, if you look at the media and elsewhere, people are discussing uh, the YPJ, which is the all-female forces of Northeast Syrian revolution fighting against ISIS, but nobody ever mentions that there has been a long struggle of feminism within the Kurdish movement in order to establish that equality and that 40% quota within the Kurdish movement today in Northeast Syria, where every level of governance needs to be at least 40% women, and there is much more beyond that in terms of understanding of the feminist pillar of this movement, which is something I'm going to come to. But long story short, then, all this history from the World War I, at least, dates back actually to the Ottoman Empire, um, but at least uh, during uh, following World War I and the deciding of the fate of this region by the colonial powers as to who gets to have the state and who doesn't, who can self-determine and who cannot, and through that forming the other colonial states, regional colonial powers that would work with the colonial powers so that their populations don't fall into communism, so that their populations don't get close to other parts of the world. So there's all these, within all these threats, colonial powers, imperial powers found their own colonial powers, regional colonizers to work with who have um, then repressed and suppressed the Kurdish populations. And that history of suppression created a long history of movements, uh, and the most important one for the Northeast Syria and the revolution that took place there is one that got started in the late 1970s, and uh, PKK has um, uh, then opened the war against the Turkish state in uh, 1984. And so 1984, they start a war of resistance and self-determination, and at the time, uh, because it's a continuity within that movement and the, Kur and the Turkish left within Turkey, that it was uh, considered to be a Marxist socialist revolution at the time, but then it got transformed through a couple of different means. One of the important ones is the women's struggle within this movement. And actually, I'm going to, um, as the women start to be involved in the PKK, they have also formed a legal parliamentarian politics within Turkey. Uh, and some of you might have heard the term HDP, uh, the People's um, Party, the, the pro-Kurdish People's Party, that's also in coalition with LGBTQ movements, with feminist movements in Turkey. And importantly, you'll see that from late 1980s and early 1990s, both the war between the PKK and the Turkish state intensified, but populations within Turkish borders and within Syrian borders, the Kurdish populations became highly involved in this resistance movement, and women, as much as men, start to participate in the guerrilla movement, but they will also start to participate in the parliamentarian politics within Turkey, and they have been involved uh, as Saturday mothers and peace mothers. So women from different class backgrounds, from different municipalities within the Kurdish um, towns have started to increasingly form a women's struggle, a women's revolution within the revolution. So that is the products of which, but I was gonna um, show you a video actually from 1991, um, Oh, let me show you which one. Yes. It is, um, it was, is it not open? Oh, I didn't put it up. 
Oh, this one. This one right there. This one there. Yes. So this is 91. Leila Zana, one of the first Kurdish oh, yeah. women parliamentarians in Turkey. In Turkey, a Kurdish parliamentarian within Turkey. And she's, uh, this is when you first get into the parliament, you have to do this um, ceremony where you praise the Turkish nation and you praise that you're going to be um, bound by, you know, the Turkish constitution. But she used her um, Kurdish flag colors, the green, uh, red, and yellow, and everybody starts already seeing, and this is the Turkish parliament, so you get to see it's full of... Uh, Turkish Sunni Muslim man. So this is everything um, that we're fighting against, but that's her. And she's gonna get um, quite a lot of reaction. If you can hear. Look at the colors. The colors, her face, it's everything that the man, the Turkish man, do not want. Oh, you can't even handle one woman speaking. And she speaks Kurdish in the Turkish parliament. And Kurdish was a forbidden language. Kurdish is a terrorist language. So she's doing something revolutionary in her own act of going there in her Kurdish flag as a woman and speaking in Kurdish. And she was put in prison for 10 years following this. But it was a very symbolic, very important, very moving act for the movement. The movement. Immediately after this? Or? Yes. Okay. This was from like supporting terrorism. So oh, wow. if you speak Kurdish in the parliament, then you are. So I mean, if you were speaking Kurdish in your own village, you can still be put in jail for being a terrorist. So, but it was a very Shame. important act, and it's, it's a bit, I think the reason I'm pulling this is it's 1991. So between this and when we are seeing the YPJ fighters fighting against ISIS, to give us the context of the long-term women's struggle within the Kurdish movement itself. And this wasn't always taken, um, so let's look into one of the pillars then um, of importance of the Rojava revolution, which is the feminist movement, and which is the fact that Rojava social contract promises women equal power, and it does pro uh, promise equality and justice for all genders. And so by means of education, the feminist education, and by means of putting a 40% quota, so every level of representation from the local villages to neighborhoods to higher up needs to have at least 40% women is the rule within the social contract. But this wasn't gained easily, right? Kurdish men are men, and they resisted this. But Öcalan was supportive of this, and with Sakine Jansız and some other women involved in the movement were able to push for these things. And at first, in the parliamentarian politics, um, the fear was that, well, if we put women in place, if we put women as candidates for the parliament, then the Kurdish populations, traditional Kurdish populations of Southeast Turkey would not vote for them. That's the mentality, the logic that the men started to try to use, at least um, for two elections. But then women actually struggle and said, if you don't do this, I'm stopping being part of this movement and I'm going to start a new revolutionary women's movement, all women's movement. So with that threat and with the, um, with the realization that the population was actually ready, and this is something that people right here and everywhere that you go to, there's always power holders and status holders who do think that they can know what the population is ready for. But the population is always ready for much more than we actually think that they're ready for. So this was a great yeah. example. And these women were elected. And they have done um, basically some of the most powerful voices within the Kurdish movement has been that of women. And that has been very inspiring. And that has been why the reason why the Rojava social contract has these rules for gender justice and equality. And importantly, the three pillars, feminism, 
ecological well-being and bottom-up direct confidential democracy, which are also aligned with the notion of anti-capitalism, although a different formulation than the classical Marxist socialist um, type fight, which we can discuss together, is, um, is, is that these pillars have to work together. The understanding is that you can't just have a fight against patriarchy when you know that the patriarchy works together and aligned with state structure and with capitalism. And so the idea is we cannot ask for women's rights or justice for women only in an unjust society. The idea is to revolutionize the society bottom up to change all forms of oppression, to resist all forms of oppression simultaneously. And this is how the states and power holders have oppressed the region historically. The episodes of violence that I have just mentioned to you were always gendered, and gendered violence against women had been used to, um, to, to basically um, Unroot the communities, unroot the places, forms of rape, forms of adoption, forced adoption, forced marriages that the state has imposed upon these people. In Amphal, we know that the widows have developed their own movements. So as the state suppresses, it does suppress women. It does use patriarchal notions, patriarchal discourses among women. Um, and so the fight needs to be against all these structures together. And the belief in the Kurdish movement is that the only people who could actually bring about a just society is women. So that we should establish an emancipation, a larger social emancipation that is based on women's emancipation. So it's quite different than the rights discourse that we're having in different movements, for example, I'm more familiar with the US, uh, where women are asking for uh, more seats or more of this in an unjust society, or even LGBTQ movements, which you know are um, to a large extent, the mainstream LGBTQ movements that are asking for marriage rights or serving in the army. So all of these things were, um, conundrums and were things to, you know, it, there are lessons to be taken from this because the idea here is that you really need to see the foundations of this unjust society and you need to destroy them. So it doesn't make sense for you to ask for equal rights in a completely unjust system. Um, so that is one of the important um, things from the Rojava revolution um, that is why we've been so interested in the Rojava revolution. And it's also important lessons to be taken from the ecology pillar here, that despite the lack of resources and funds, um, from earlier on, Öcalan was also influenced by the writings of Murray Bookchin. And he um, uh, said that the fight against, um, you know, the oppression of women by man is similar to the oppression of ecology and non-human by human. And this is the dialectics of oppression and resistance again, because if you look at state violence, you'll see that state violence has always been as much against ecology as it is against human. For example, in Syria, you see that Kurds were especially forced to do monocropping and deforestation in the region to only produce wheat. Uh, which has deforested their regions and which has destroyed their environment and ecology um, to a large extent. So the oppressor states are using this. And Turkey, from 1930s on, has opened a war against the environment, against the mountains and the rivers that it thought were unruly, right? I've been doing research on state archives, and you would be very surprised to read the terms that the state and the rulers uh, have used to refer to the geo Kurdish geographies, that people are unruly here because they live in the mountains. And so if we bring them to flat and if we build dams and hydroelectric power plants to kick people out of the mountains and mining projects so that people are basically moved from the top where we can't govern, we can't put our military there, into the flat lands where we can establish military. So this military, militarized nation state power uh, has attacked geography and environment 
as much as it has attacked the people. So then the idea of the revolution is, so therefore, we need to protect ecology, we need to have ecologically driven social policies, and uh, um, importantly also we need to provide um, the resources equally to the people who are living on these lands, all people living on these lands. So it has been a fight then against capitalism, against patriarchy, against state, against oppressive structures of any kind. And that is why the Rojava Revolution with feminists, its feminist and ecological vision, and with his understanding of direct but not democracy, and multiplicity and diversity and the coexistence um, of all peoples who are paying attention to and being sensitive to their ecology and environment has been very inspiring for us, for <laughs> Emergency Committee Rojava for us Kurds who are on the, you know, um, working with different progressive movements historically. And um, and I think we could open up any of these pillars um, during our discussion. Um, so thank you so much for having me again. And I'm looking forward to your questions, comments, 